So the next slide, please. So um, as noted here in the MMWR, uh, in the, the two-week period between the 14th to the 23rd of December, uh, VAERS reports detected 21 cases of anaphylaxis after the administration of reported 1.8 million doses, first doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. So the calculations then based on that were 11.1 .1 cases per million doses. 71% um, of these occurred within 15 minutes of the vaccination. Next slide. If you notice here in the 21 cases that were reported, um, the patients uh, uh, that had a previous history of allergic reaction are shown in the lighter color blue. Those individuals who had no previous history of allergic reactions are shown in the darker color of blue. So you can see most of them, at least the early ones, had a history of, of allergies. I think there's some background noise. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, as you see, also nearly all of them occurred within 30 minutes uh, and most of them within 15 minutes. Next slide. And so in the phenotypes of those 21 patients with anaphylaxis, the mean age was 40. Um, uh, the large majority, 90% were females. The, the mean time uh, to, uh, or the median time to onset was 13 minutes. 71% um, had symptom onset within less than 15 minutes and 80 uh, per plus percent had symptom onset in less than 30 minutes. Um, and again, overall 80% had a history of allergies or allergic reactions. Next slide. Um, in addition, I think that, that besides those 21, um, there has also been a, an announcement that there are now 29 um, after the uh, after the vaccination, um, which and and also there are uh, at least two uh, Moderna anaphylaxis uh, cases. So both of the vaccines have been associated with anaphylaxis. The anaphylaxis definitions are those that meet the Brighton criteria, either uh, Brighton one or Brighton two. Next slide. Now, we know overall that the vaccine safety data link uh, in terms of potential anaphylaxis uh, for all vaccinations, including TIV, is about 1.3 per million. Um, and if you exclude TIV, it's also about 1.3 per million. So what we're saying here then, it looks from the early signals that the rate of anaphylaxis with this particular vaccine is tenfold higher than what we would see with the other vaccinations. Next slide. If one looks at the VAERS databases also with other uh, rates per million doses for MMR, uh, uh, pneumococcal polysaccharide, varicella, and influenza, and then also looking at, at uh, 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 non-reviewed, non-serious reports, again, that the rate of, of anaphylaxis with other vaccines is about one in a million. So it does indeed suggest that this vaccine um, has a greater risk of that, but still about one in a hundred thousand. Next slide. The profiles of anaphylaxis uh, in the VAERS prior to this time were somewhat similar in uh, what we're seeing now, that 80% of the, of the people who had been reported to VAERS to have anaphylactic events after vaccine were female, that the vast majority of those uh, women also had ATP with asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, or food or drug allergies, but not all, and about 40% uh, did not have such a history. The characteristics of the reactions in anaphylactic, anaphylactic reactions to other vaccines were uh, prompt as well in that 77% of them occurred with less than two hours. The median time to onset after vaccination was 20 minutes. And um, though, that, though most could be severe, the majority recovered, but there were four, excuse me, eight fatalities, four among individuals without ATP 
and four among individuals who, who were atopic. And as you know, at this time, there has been prompt uh, uh, management of these cases. Several of the patients did have to be hospitalized, but there have been no fatalities with the anaphylaxis associated with the COVID. Next slide. Um, as we know, um, the Brighton collaboration provided case definitions, and these have been extraordinarily helpful uh, in the assessment of these patients. Um, next slide. In terms of, of trying to assess the pathogenesis of these vaccine reactions, um, the CISA consortium has been um, uh, very much uh, supported and, uh, uh, and enhanced by the interactions of a, very, a group of, of very dedicated allergists uh, led by Bob Wood at Hopkins, but also including uh, Donna Hummel and Allison Norton at Vanderbilt and a number of, of uh, uh, um, uh, Josh Milner at Columbia uh, and Kim uh, and, and a number of other uh, individuals at each of the CESA sites. It is felt that these immediate type reactions um, are not clear, but the pathogenesis likely is either IgE mediated or a non IgE mediated mechanism called CARPA, which I will discuss. And also, vasovagal or syncope needs to be included, but all of the patients that have, have been, were reported uh, fulfilled the Brighton 1 and Brighton 2. So they indeed did represent anaphylaxis. Next slide. So just to remind you, um, the biology of the type uh, IgE type 1 hypersensitivity response, this is a, a figure uh, that is, depicts antibiotic allergies, but it's exactly the same. You have a cephalosporin, hapton, um, that stimulates the dendritic cells in concert with MHC2. Uh, naive T cells uh, are stimulated with cytokines. Uh, Th1 cells are generated. B cells are generated, which then lead to plasma cell production of IgE with the first encounter. With the second encounter, which such this would be a penicillin or cephalosporin, um, the immediate interaction between the preformed IgE and the antigen causes cross-linking of these IgE molecules with the immediate uh, release of, urticaria, of, of mediators, which lead to urticaria, angioedema, bronchospasm, cardiovascular collapse, and anaphylaxis. So this type 1 response does require a prior exposure to the antigen and subsequent uh, stimulation with a second immune signal. Next slide. There is also another immediate kind of hypersensitivity response called CARPA, complement activation related pseudoallergy. And what happens with CARPA is that complement is, is activated either by liposomes uh, by IgM or IgG or by actual particles, nanoparticles, um, that this complement activation does not uh, depend upon preformed antibody, that um, the complement mediator are formed, which are also anaphylatoxins, uh, C3A and C5A. The mast cell is stimulated and the immune response uh, uh, is, is triggered uh, such that immediate sensitization occurs just like you would see in the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction that is based uh, on the um, IgE-mediated response. Next slide. So the differences between the IgE-mediated type 1 response and CARPA um, are, are that the symptoms are really common between both reactions. So all of the, the uh, findings that you see with anaphylaxis are identical. What happens, however, with IgE-mediated type 1 is that it requires, um, uh, arises after repeated exposure to the allergen, that the reaction is often stronger with repeated uh, uh, exposure, and the reaction does not cease without treatment. 
In contrast, the CARPA, as I mentioned before, does not require a prior exposure to the antigen that um, often the repeat on the, is the second repeat uh, exposure has fewer symptoms and there may be spontaneous resolution. So one of the things that, that is occurring at this time is we re, there is a lot of hypothesis that this um, mediated reaction might be related, an IgE type 1 reaction that might be related to the, fine, to the addition of polyethylene glycol, which is involved in the vaccine of the, uh, in both mRNA vaccines. The other possibility is this CARPA kind of reaction. And of these two mechanisms, it's not clear yet which of those uh, is indeed case is indeed the case is operative. Next slide. So just to remind you that the Pfizer vaccine on the left and the Moderna vaccine on the right contains nucle nucleoside modified mRNA um, as the actual antigen. But there are lipids that are, are uh, surrounding the vaccine. Um, and as you can see here, both of them contain polyethylene glycol, phosphocholine, cholesterol, um, and there is a proprietary lipid uh, to Moderna that is not, uh, not the same as in seen, seen in Pfizer. Plus there are salts and sugars and buffers, uh, which are, are uh, in general not felt to be allergenic. So one of the questions is, could this be to polyethylene glycol? Next slide. Polyethylene glycols um, are a, a repeating uh, subunit, as you can see here. They also bear some semblance to polysorbates, uh, which polysorbates are also a frequent uh, component in vaccines. So one of the questions is, if this is, is related to polyethylene glycol, then is it also related to polysorbates? And should both of these be, uh, um, be assessed or be uh, 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 eliminated at this time in these patients? Next slide. So because the mechanism is not clear at this time, um, there is a suggestion to avoid in these patients that have had severe anaphylactic responses to avoid uh, PEG and polysorbate. Um, and you can see here, this is a um, the polysorbate. Uh, are, uh, a number of the vaccines do contain polysorbate. Um, the PEG is only in the two mRNA vaccines. Um, it does appear also that both the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca have some of the polysorbate uh, as well. So this may be an issue uh, if indeed this is the problem with other vaccines, not just the mRNA vaccines, although we don't know that at this time. Next slide. So the current recommendations uh, for, uh, for the management of these reactions are the careful documentation of the vitals and the signs and the symptoms, um, the understanding that many of the symptoms will accelerate over the first hour, um, the prompt administration of epinephrine in these individuals who have the anaphylaxis, um, and that the being available uh, and uh, accessible in the vaccine site. So when this happens, that, that, that patients can be promptly treated. If a second treatment of epinephrine is needed, uh, many people feel, many of the allergists feel that the patient should be admitted for uh, observation. And two of the subjects um, that have, have been reported in the MMWR did have to have uh, uh, epinephrine drips uh, over the night uh, after their exposure. We are also suggesting that all of these patients who have the adverse events between 30 to 60 minutes um, have a, a serum tryptase um, done, which would indicate activation of the mast cells. Um, in addition, uh, there has been a request that, act, that uh, complement activation markers be also obtained during that time. So one could see uh, whether there is complement activation through the CARPA mechanism. In addition, saving Sarah for future studies to look at IgE, IgM, and IgG to PEG. 
at this time, there are no commercial assays that are measuring uh, any of these antibodies to PEG. Um, the FDA and one of their research labs is working on this, and this is something that, that is hoped will be able to be provided. I think because of many of the sites um, really were not um, uh, did respond very appropriately to the anaphylaxis, but we're not um, immunologists or allergists. And, and so we do have some tryptase and complement levels that by and large, most of the patients at this point did not have that assessment. Next slide. Um, the CDC, based on this, and hopefully you can see it, um, has made uh, some revisions to the triaging of patients that are presented for COVID. Um, and as you can see here, um, in those patients that have an allergy to oral medications or history of food, pet, insect, venom, environmental latex allergies, or a family history of allergies, um, they are being recommended to have a 30-minute observation period with a, per with a history of anaphylaxis in any of those situations and 15 minutes observation with no other history of anaphylaxis. In those individuals who've had a history of immediate allergic reaction to vaccine or injectable therapies, um, except those that, that are part of, of COVID, um, they are being uh, asked to, um, to defer their vaccination uh, uh, either to consider deferral of their vaccination with a referral to an allergist or an immunologist um, or to a 30-minute observation period if vaccinated. And quite clearly, <coughs> excuse me, in those individuals who've had severe allergic reactions after a previous dose of COVID, an immediate or allergic reaction with a previous dose of COVID, or an immediate allergic reaction to any of any severity to polysorbate, uh, the suggestion has been made that they not be vaccinated. So at this point, this is how um, this has been, imp the, the response to the implementation um, of this has occurred uh, from the CDC guidelines. 